Thank you. Okay. Oh, shut up. Come on. Have a seat. Are you ready? I don't think so. <laughs> Let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We humbly come before you to give you our hearts and our lives. Lead us to know that you love us. Lead us to know that you were born just to give up your life for our sins. Help us to know that you are the God of great mercy. And help us to experience this mercy this day. We beg you these things, Lord Jesus, in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, ladies. This is different for me. It's been a while since I spoke to all women, and I'm awful excited about it. I'm a little afraid about it, but that's okay. But we're going to be sitting there, and you know, uh, the first speaker did such a phenomenal job with the Word of God. And again, you need, absolutely, wasn't she phenomenal? And you need to have a Bible. And ladies are much better than this than men. Usually with the men, they look at me like, ooh, it's a Bible. You know, but the ladies are usually much better. But ladies, like she was saying about every day she meets Christ in the Word. That's just something you need to do. You go there because the Word of God can touch our hearts, can bring us healing, can bring us to know that the deepest need in everyone's heart is what? To be loved. And we seek it all these places. But it's right here waiting for us. The God of love wants to whisper to our hearts every day that he loves us and that we come to that. And all of us, men and women, need to know that more than anything, that we are loved by the Father. That's why, you know, again, I think that too many people, nobody here, but there are other people, you know, outside who every time they go to pray, they think that God really doesn't like them much. You know, he kind of puts up with them. And they spend so much time focused on themselves and their sinfulness and their unworthiness that God's looking at them and saying, would you look at me for a minute? Would you look at me? I love you. That's why I gave my son for you. I held nothing back to prove to you that I've loved you. Nothing. But often when we come to prayer, we're just saying a bunch of words and doing a bunch of things instead of being in the experience of the love of our Father or Jesus or the Spirit. And so we need to really make sure that this, everything we're talking about, I'm going to be talking about confession, that it isn't a ritual only we go through. It is a relationship of love where I go to the God of the universe and I tell him I'm sorry for my sins. And the God of the universe loves to embrace us and say, and I forgive you. As long as we're sorry, he's always willing to forgive us, huh? And so to do this, we need to, we're going to start some bad news and we'll go some good news. But I, I want you to either focus on the reality of the icon that's here, or you can have it because you most, everybody got a card. Did you get the card of the icon? And they explained it a little bit. And again, the icon is the symbol of life. The most powerful words that were ever said by any human being was the words of the Blessed Mother. When she was confronted with the will of God, she said, yes, so be it, let it be done to me. Now again, this yes, so be it, let it be done to me, isn't like the Islam, like, oh, if Allah wills it, he wills it, uh -uh. This yes of Our Lady was this thing that she says, it's a active wanting of the will of God, meaning that I want your will more than I want my next breath. Huh? That's what kind of yes that Mary leads us to and guides us to. That's why when we gave you this and we put in the back the Annunciation, that you can sit there and say this prayer and say yes with Mary. Because always it's saying yes to the will of God. Because when we go back to the first Eve, you know, and again, people give the first Eve a bad rap, do they not? Yeah. And it comes from St. Paul. I think St. Paul was wrong. I'm sorry. But the reality was, when Eve was being tempted, where was Adam? Right next to Eve. But he kept his mouth shut. He should have protected his wife. He was not a man. And he was created to be the first man, and he wasn't. From the very beginning, we have messed up. And when I do a men's conference, I say, I say gentlemen, how many of you would sit there and give your life with someone going to come in and kill your wife and kids? And they'll go, oh, yeah, Father, we would. Shut up. 
I say, are you a man of prayer? Does your family know that you pray for them every day? Do you go and work, look at the world, the flesh, and the devil, and when you pray every day because you're this man of prayer, say, you got to go through me before you get to my wife and kids. And see, that's the problem. A lot of men don't do that. They don't consider themselves spiritual leaders the way they're called to be. Their job and Adam's job was to, with you, protect you spiritually. And so it wasn't Eve's fault. It was Adam's fault. Adam wasn't protecting his wife. Just, just so you know. <laughs> but anyway. But the reality is that we need to know that when we say no, like Eve and Adam did, death is brought into the world. Whenever you and I sin, we become instruments of death, right? Because the one no to God from our first parents brought in what we call original sin. And we're all born into that original sin because of one or two persons no to God's will. So we need to know what sin does and what it is. Sin kills us and it kills everybody that we deal with, our families, our friends, our community. Sin kills us. But when we say yes, like Mary did, the new Eve, we bring life to the world. We bring salvation to the world. We bring transformation to the world. So that we're all called to always keep in mind Mary's yes. And that you and I got to say yes to every day. And when we say no, we need to repent. We need to say, I'm sorry. We need to say, I'm, I know I was created to be an instrument of life. And I was created to bring an instrument of salvation and to bring life to the world and people. But I didn't. I brought death. I'm sorry. And when you and I do that, again, the God of the universe comes and he transforms us. He can change our no into a humongous yes. And so think about, am I truly the person God created me to be, to be this life giver, huh? And so when we go and we think about sin, again, you do realize, like when I have a parish, uh, when I do a parish mission, I just came back, yesterday I was in <laughs> Dickinson, North Dakota, you know, it was snowing when I took off yesterday, early in the morning, oh, 26 degrees, huh? Ugh. And I says, Dickinson makes Erie look great. But anyway, the reality was, while we were there, you know, I spoke every night for two hours, and we did this parish mission, there were all these people, a great, it was a great town, a great, uh, a great place. But when often I talk about the reality, what sin does is kill us, yes. But the whole reason Jesus Christ was born was to save us. Yes. Right? That's the whole thing. You know, if you ever come to my parish for our, our, our Christmas Advent, our Advent service, our, our penance service, you know, it only lasts five minutes. Five minutes. Because no, none of you really, you know, when we do these long penance services, nobody really cares, do they? You know it's true. You just want to get through, get to confession, and get out of there. So... It's, we know it. When, you know, when Father Dedish, you know Father Dedish, he likes to do a half-hour service, and he'll talk for four hours, and, and it goes on. And I'm like, can I talk some more? And it goes on. And Anyway, so, but the reality is nobody cares. They just want to be forgiven. So our penance service is five minutes. I get up and I read from Matthew's gospel. So the ten of you nice Protestant ladies who came to be with us and have your Bibles, please go with me to Matthew's gospel. <laughs> I'm sure there's some Bread of Life people here that brought your Bible. If not, you're going to get an extra penance next time you come to confession. But anyway, we're going to go to Matthew's Gospel, the very beginning. And in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 21, he's talking to Joseph. And then in verse 21 of Matthew, verse 21 of uh, Matthew chapter 1, he said, you, she is to have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The whole reason Jesus Christ was born was to save us from our sins. Huh? But we got to know that sin, let's go there for a minute too. Can, can, can you ladies take me if I be a little strong for a couple minutes? No crying. I'm just telling you now. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Okay. And we're going to start with the bad news before we go with the good news. Can we handle this? 
Don't get mad. Okay, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals the Lord God had made. Who is the serpent? The devil. What was his name? Not Satan, his real name. Lucifer. And what's Lucifer mean? The light bearer, the bearer of light. What kind of angel is uh, Lucifer? Uh-uh, not an archangel. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Seraph angel. Of the nine choirs, the seraph are the ones that deal with God. The ones that minister to God. So here's Lucifer, the seraph angel, the bearer of light. Now again, ladies, you got to know that the devil never appears to us as something ugly. Come on. Really, he doesn't come to us with a little pitchfork and the ugly horns and he has a tail and he goes, ah, we'd all go, ah, and run. He's, not, he's much smarter than we give him credit for. He loves those spooky movies, though, that make him seem like really ugly. He just, he loves that. Because then we don't see him for as he is. The devil, as uh, Paul would say, often appears as an angel of light. So he appears as something good. You know, if you ever read the life of Padre Pio, or Padre Pio was tempted by the devil in two different ways. Once the devil appeared to Padre Pio as the blessed mother. Another time he appeared to Padre Pio as Jesus Christ himself. So you got to know, ladies, that the way the devil ch challenges all of us and tempts us is the things that appear to be good, things that appear to be light. And so that's why we really need to be people of prayer so we can discern the difference. Because if he was to appear to you as the Blessed Mother, we'd be sitting there selling uh, uh, you know, tickets. I saw the Blessed Mother come. Look at she. She's here. She was in my room, right? We would think, oh, it's for sure the devil could not appear as the Blessed Mother. Well, he did to Padre Pio. So the reality is, the devil always appears to us as an appearance of something good. So we got to make sure that we have discernment. And where that comes from is the Holy Spirit, and we become these people of prayer. So we know the voice of God. Because remember in John's Gospel, when Jesus is talking about he's the good shepherd, he said, my sheep know my voice. And the only way you'll come to know the voice of the shepherd is if you listen to it every day in his word. You'll be able to tell the difference between the devil, the world, and the Lord. If you don't let's spend time with his word every day, you're not going to get to know his voice. So it's important that we do that. So here's the devil. And the devil, the way he gets all of us this very day, is he tempts us by asking the question. Right? Now, I'm not telling you not to ask questions. You better ask questions. God gave you a mind. Don't take anything, okay, Father said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's stupid. Right? <laughs> Don't believe everything I tell you. Are you kidding me? You sit there and you got to make sure that you question when things need to be questioned. Use your mind. That's why God gave it to you. But when God tells you something, you got to believe it. So the devil comes and says to Eve and Adam, did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees of the garden? Now, there were lots of trees in the garden, right? But the two main trees were what? The tree of life, which gave eternal life, and the tree of knowledge. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil, correct? So here we go. We have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, was there anything wrong with the tree, ladies? No. Was it poisonous? No, the only thing wrong with the tree was what? God said no. Sin is ultimately just saying no to God, right? It's just that simple. Sin is to disobey God. Now, again, often like my kids, I taught at prep for eight years, right? And the boys would sit there and say, well, Father, I don't think that's a sin. And I'd say, well, son, nobody asked you, right? <laughs> And see, God doesn't ask us if we think something is sinful. He doesn't say, hey, do you agree with me? You know, and again, we don't like that sometimes, do we? But isn't it amazing? The same people. Let's say you have five children. You know, you're a lady here and you have five kids. And you make a rule at your house. You will be in the house by 8 o'clock every night. And your five kids get together one day and they say, we're going to vote. And so they vote. They don't like your thing about being in at 8 o'clock. And so these children of yours come and vote, and they come to you and say, Hey, Ma, 
Yeah. You love us, don't you? I love you very much. Well, then we voted, and we don't like that rule. We're going to change it. We're not going to come in at 8. We're going to come in at midnight. What are you going to do? What? You'll now be in at 6, you little pagan children. <laughs> now, do you do that because you hate your children? No, you do that because you love your children. Your house, your rules, correct? God's life, God's world, God's rules. If you can say what you say in your house, and it must be obeyed, and you say to them what? You don't like it? Go somewhere else. My house, my rules. God's house, God's rules. Now again, when people get mad at God and they say, I don't think that's being very nice. So you're not being very nice when you have rules at your home? You're loving them. That's why. Everything God gives us as a rule is to save us, not hurt us. You know that. It's to save us from what? Death. He wants us to have life. So we always got to know that every rule God gives us is for life. It's not so we deny ourselves and we just sit there. Uh, it's for always something good. So let's go on. Did God really say you can't eat from the tree? Did God really say you can't miss Mass on Sunday? Did God really say you can't use artificial birth control? Did God really say you can't commit abortion? Did God really say you do that? I don't think that's a, I think that's a bunch of men in Rome. They had nothing better to do than to tell us what to do. Really? Is that what it is? The Word of God, when it says that, must be lying, huh? The Word of God was written by men. They didn't know anything any, any better either. God is God. You do realize God is not man or woman, correct? God is spirit. And so it's the God of the universe who revealed himself in the man Jesus Christ, but the God of the universe gives us the rules to everybody. You can't decide whether they're right or wrong, as we'll see in a moment. So we go on. We may eat, she says, we may eat of all the fruit of the trees of the garden. It's only about the fruit in the tree in the middle of the garden that God said you shall not eat it or touch it lest you die. So she had full knowledge, correct? Her full knowledge says, God told us, if we do take from that tree, we're going to die. So God says, if you sin, you will die. Listen to what the devil says. Then the devil said to the woman, you certainly will not die. Somebody's lying. Correct? Either God's a liar or the devil's a liar. Now, Jesus called the devil the father of lies and a liar from the beginning. Huh? So people around you sit there and say, oh, I know the church teaches that that's wrong, but who what's the church know? Or I know that's what it says in the Bible, but come on, that ain't going to kill you. If God loves you, he won't let you die, right? And God says, no, I'll give you what you want, right? That's the first penalty of all sin. You do know that. The first penalty of sin is God gives us what we want. Right? So you decide to go commit adultery. So you commit adultery. Your husband finds out. Your kids find out. They hate your guts for the rest of your life. You blame God. How can they hate me? Excuse me. God gave you what you wanted. But everything you want has a consequence. Right? Everything has consequences. See, in the world today, we try to teach people nothing has consequences. You can do anything you want and we'll take care of you. Uh-uh. Like when I used to teach my boys, I said, to, what I could do to make them men is teach them everything you do has a consequence for good or for bad. In the spiritual life, ladies, everything we do has a consequence for good or for bad. But it's our choice, right? Our choice. And God says, is that what you want? That's what you want. That's what I want. You can have it. And then when he gives it to you, we get all mad. <laughs> you know, but he said, that's what you wanted. I gave it to you. So come on. You certainly shall not die, he says. No, God knows well at the moment you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Why? How are you going to be like God? Knowing what is right and knowing what is wrong. What does this mean? It means that when you become like God, that the God of the universe, you decide what's right and you decide what's wrong, right? So you decide. So you sit there and say, like, for instance, and everybody here does this, oh, I don't think missing Mass on Sunday is a sin. Well, then who are you? You're God. 
I don't think sex before marriage is a sin. Then who are you? God. I don't think artificial birth control is a sin. Then who are you? God. You're saying, I decide what's right. And I decide what's wrong. And if I think it's right, it's right. If I think it's wrong, it's wrong. Well, let me bow before you, almighty God. Because that's what you're doing. You all know Tom Cruise, right? No Tom Cruise? Tom Cruise, huh? Well, Tom Cruise, you do realize, was going to be a priest. Because he was Catholic at one time. And he was in the seminary. He studied for the Franciscans, right? God saved us. But that's beside the point. So, the reality once, years before I was even ordained, I'm watching Tom Cruise, and as Tom's on there, he sits there, and he's, uh, he's on TV with Barbara Walters. And Barbara says, Tom, and he goes, yes, Barbara. You used to be Catholic, didn't you? Oh, yes. And what is he now? Scientologist. Well, Tom, why did you leave the Catholic Church and become a Scientologist? And he thought he was so cool. He says, well, you know how Catholics and Christians and Buddhists and all those people, they have to obey someone else's rules. In Scientology, we make our own. Whoa. You are so cool, Tom. <laughs> you will become like God. Now, I always love that because I've gotten a lot of debates with Scientologists and they say, we create our own reality. I say, do you? Yes. Come here. Let me take my gun here, I have one, and let me put all the bullets in, let me put it next to your head, and let me pull the trigger. You stop the bullet, God of the universe. <laughs> it's a lie. We can't even control our, that's very violent, I'm sorry, ladies. We can't even control our next breath without God saying, okay. You understand? If you think you're in control, try to take that next breath without God giving you the okay. Ultimately, every breath we take is dependent upon God. So anyway, she takes from the tree, gives some to Adam. The two of them take from the tree, they sin, and a hole gets knocked in their soul. And all of our life, we're always trying to fill up the emptiness. Again, as we talked about in the beginning, that the deepest need in everyone's heart is to be loved. And we try everything in our power to fulfill this need, right? And somewhere in our lives, we've got to come to know that only God, which is eternal, can fill our need. We try to fill it up, and we do it, you know, we use the story about, you know, when you were a little kid, what did you want more than anything else in the whole wide world? And we were about two years old. Chocolate, of course. You know, that never changes, does it? So you're sitting there and thinking, oh, if I had chocolate, I would be so happy. Oh. Easter Sunday comes, you get a big bowl black, it's full of chocolate. And you go in there and you grab that bunny and you eat the ears off. You eat the head off. You eat the old body. Then you go after those little chocolate eggs and you eat every one of them. And by Easter Sunday night, you have eaten the whole basket of chocolate. What happens? It comes out this way or it comes out this way, huh? And I'm not happy. Sorry, forgot women. So the reality is I'm not happy. Then later on, you're about uh, five years old, and what do you want? You want a tricycle. Oh, if I had a tricycle, I'd be happy. And you get a tricycle, and you drive it all around. And oh, I'm not happy. And then later on, what do you want? If you're 16 years old, car, mom and dad, can you get me a car? Please, 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 please. I'll never ask you for nothing in my whole life. Please, can I have a car? And they get you a car. I don't like the color. Can I have some money for gas? And I have to pay for my own insurance? And I'm not happy. Later on, oh, if I had this guy, I would be so happy. Boom, boom. I have this guy. I'm not happy. Oh, if I had money, money would make me happy. You get all kinds of money. Most people who commit suicide are rich, not poor. I'm not happy. Maybe if I had power, power will give me things. And then you lose it. I'm not happy. Because everything we try in life, it's like we got a hole knocked in our bucket that we got when we were created. And that's what original sin is. It's a hole in our bucket. And we're constantly trying to fill it. And I fill it with everything. And I try everything. And again, you might be happy for a day, a month, a year, a couple years. But I promise you, anything on this earth, anything, will eventually go right on through and make you unhappy. The only thing that will make you and me happy is when we come to know the love of the Father. Because it's an eternal thing. It never dries up. And so every day you and I need to go there and be filled with the love of our God.
and knowing that everything else, you know, Mother Teresa used to tell a story in, in, uh, in, in uh, India, and she would say, the people in India, some of them are so hungry that they would actually pick up dog dung and eat it to fill the emptiness. Ladies, there's so many people in America and throughout the world that are so hungry that they'll eat anything to fill that emptiness. The only thing that'll fill your emptiness is the love of Jesus, is his love for you, who gave everything on the cross for love of you. And so what has to happen, though, is somewhere we got to stop thinking of sin as something, oh, I, you know, I'm sorry, I broke another. You know, I am a virgin, 54-year-old virgin. You ever see one? Take a look. This is what they look like. Now, some of you are saying, oh, Father, I know what you're a virgin. If you looked in the mirror lately, shut up. I've had my chances, huh? But the reality is, let's say, for instance, I got tired of being a virgin, and I decided to go down somewhere, I'm sure, in Erie, they have prostitutes, and I pick up a prostitute, and I have sex with her. <laughs> what would I have to do to be forgiven? Go to confession. Could I still be a priest? Yep. Could I still go to heaven? Could I still be a saint? Yes. So, that's not the only thing, trust me, I'm not strong enough to, be, to do that just because it was, a, it was a, a vow I took. I'm not strong enough. The only reason I haven't is because that was the gift that I gave to Jesus when I got ordained. And so that was the thing, Lord, I would never hurt you. Like I used to tell my boys, gentlemen, you'd never commit adultery against your wife, would you? And they also used to all say, well, no, Father, why? Because it's a rule you shall not commit adultery? Well, no, why wouldn't you? Because I'd love her and I wouldn't want to hurt her. Ding, 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 ding. When we come to the place in our life where we don't want to sin because we don't want to hurt the Lord who loves us, now we're on the right path. You know, that became real to me years ago. I'm a Pittsburgher. God's a Steeler fan, as we all know. And as I was growing up in the city of Pittsburgh, my mother, I don't know if you know this, but my mother graduated highest ever from the Pittsburgh Police Academy to this very day. My mother was a cop. My father was a cop. I got to know lots of different cops and that, but that's another story. The reality was, in growing up in Pittsburgh, I had a, a friend call me once when I was in seminary. And he had a farm out in the, uh, in the, uh, way up in New York. And he called me and says, hey, Larry, you want to come to the farm? I go, no, I don't want to come to the farm. He says, I'll come to the farm. I said, okay, I went to the farm. Now, when you go to the farm, it isn't the most pretty thing because I had to go up there and I had to learn how to milk cows. Anybody here ever milk a cow? Oh, really? It's unbelievable. So you should, I asked this in North Dakota, and everybody's hand went up. I go, okay. Anyway, so I sat there, and I says, well, you know, it's an interesting thing when you go in to milk cows because, you know, you have to get them into the place, and you, you, know, you milk them every 12 hours, 6 in the morning, 6 at night, whatever it is, and you have to tie them in, and they eat, and while they're eating, and they're, they're behind them is a trough, and they, like, urinate and manure crap in the back there, and they're there. And so when you get them to, you have to get them up to start, you know, doing what you need to do to clean them, to milk them. So you get them to stand up so you can clean their udders. You know how this goes. And you take the machine. But when you get them to stand up, sometimes that cow will take their tail, which has been laying in the manure in the urine, and slap you in the face. I know this from experience, ladies. I want you to think about it next time you're drinking milk. But anyway, so... We go and we're doing the evening, true story, I do not make up my stories, uh -huh. trust me. So anyway, we're going to do the evening milking, one of the cows is missing, we'll call her Bessie, she really didn't have a name Bessie, we're just giving her a name just because nothing else to do. So anyway, so we, we go out and find her, she's about a mile in the pasture, it's a big, a big uh, uh, pasture there, and Bessie had just had a beautiful baby bull calf. He was all black, except for a little white mark underneath his neck, huh? He was all black except for a little white mark underneath his neck. Explain it to the person next to you, okay? Anyway, so, he, this bull calf just came out of his mother, and I thought, oh, I wish I could have seen it, but I didn't see it. I missed this bull calf being born. And I said, now what are you gonna do? He said, well, let's get the cow going. If we can get the cow to move, the, 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 the bull calf will move with it. So we're trying to push the cow, hit the bow. Cow wasn't moving, moo. Cows are the laziest animals on earth. That's why we eat them. But anyway, so we're going. And I said, now what do you go? He says, we're going to have to carry the calf. And I said, okay, carry the calf. He says, why don't you carry the calf? Because I don't know how to carry a calf. I'm a pizza burger. And he says, come on. Okay. Now, the way you're supposed to carry a calf is like this. By all fours. I don't know. I'm a pizza burger. So I says, how do I carry the calf? He said, have you ever seen the picture of the good shepherd? Well, sure. He said, well, bend down. I'll put the calf over your neck. Dumb pizza burger. Okay. I bent down. 
He picked the bull calf. They're not that heavy, but he picked it up over my neck, and I start walking, carrying this bull calf like this. While I'm walking, this bull calf did not like being six foot high in the air. And as I'm walking, he's going, and he'd shake, but I'd hold on him real tight. I'm a stubborn Pittsburgher, you know. And I'm walking, and he's going, and he's shaking, and I'm still holding tight. And all of a sudden, I felt a little trickle on the side of my neck. <laughs> this little trickle became a gushing liquid. Into my hair, <laughs> into my mouth. <laughs> I had a white t-shirt on, it suddenly became bright yellow. This bull calf was urinating all over me, huh? You think I let go of that bull calf? No, I'm a stubborn Pittsburgher, so I'm wet anyway. So I finally get up there, I throw the bull calf down, and I throw the bull calf down. He kind of looks at me and he has it goes moo with a little smirk on its face. I wanted to have veal that night for dinner. But they explained Veal's baby calf, you know. Anyway, but they wouldn't let me. So I had to go take a shower. Well, I was hoping to take a shower, but they had no showers on the farm up there. I had to take a bath. Now, I don't know if you've been urinated on. Maybe some of you ladies have with babies. You've been urinated on and had to take a shower of that bath. So I had to go in the bath. They didn't even have Mr. Bubble there, right? I'm sitting there in the bathtub, and as I'm sitting in the bathtub, there is this yellow stuff floating on the top of the water. Disgusting, disgusting, disgusting. And I had a revelation from Almighty God. And God looked at me and says, hey, Richards, that's what he teaches me. It says that when he went to teach me something. Yes, God, you see what that calf did to you? Yes, God, thank you, I'm sinning in it. He says, that's what you do to me every time you sin. Don't you say these things to me, God. Because I want to see is, oh, yeah, my sin is, yeah, I just, I took another cookie. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to do it. That's okay, uh -uh. Sin is hurting someone who loves me. When you and I came to Christ, when we were baptized or gave our life to Jesus, Jesus is the good shepherd, and he picks us up on his shoulders, and the only thing he wants is to carry us home. And when we sin, we say, let me down. This is sin, the center of all sins, what? Spell sin, S-I-N. The center of all sin is I. Me, my way, I'll do it my way, let me down. And we do our business on God. But he never lets us go. The only thing he wants is to get us home. Unless you look at him and say, no, you put me down. Done. Then he'll let you go. But when we sin, he still loves us. He still comes for us. And all he wants us is to come back and say we're sorry. Now, we need to make good confessions. That's why confession is. You know, people are petrified of confession. You know, again, when I do a parish mission, like this past week, but it was even longer, the average since the last person went to confession when I do a mission is 30 five years except in North Dakota this time I had eight eight over 50 years they hadn't been to confession in 50 years so there are people here in this congregation here that I know haven't been to confession in a long time why because you might be afraid why because some priest who was nuts yelled at you once instead of loved you once in a confessional and that can turn you away forever Huh? I was just in Rome, and I went to confession just a couple of years ago, and I went to confession. I had a friend of mine. We're all priests. I'm on sabbatical, and I said to my buddy, hey, I'm going to go to confession. We're at uh, Mary Major. Father Dedish is here, and I was just talking about you. Ah, oh, very good. It was all bad. Anyway, so I go, I'm, I'm starting to, I go to go to confession, and uh, I said, I'll just go here, and I go in. I say, hey, Father, I'm a priest, and I says it's been like it was two weeks since my last confession, and this priest started to yell at me. And I mean, not just a, yell a little bit. I mean, scream at me. And I'm like, I was totally shocked. I go, okay, Father, okay. And he said, for your rosary, you'll say, for your uh, penance, you'll say a rosary. <laughs> okay. And I walked out of there, I was so mad. I thought, ooh, I had to say my rosary for him because I wanted him dead. You know, it's just like one of these things like, <laughs> really, really? You're going to get, really? And I was so angry because he was not a representative of God in any way, shape, or form. He thought he was holy. He was not. He thought his judgment would do something to me. Yes, it would make me leave the Catholic Church if I wasn't a priest already. And knowing that he was not the representative of Almighty God. And so we got to know that there are people that are good and there are people that are bad, even that wear these. 
And his job, our job, is to be the instrument of salvation and mercy. Now, sometimes you might need a kick in the butt, right? Like if you were to come into confession and you say, oh, Father, I committed adultery, I'm sorry, he should be very gentle with you. But you say, Father, I committed adultery and I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Father should not yell at you. He should whack you. <laughs> what? Are you going to... Oh, I do this with men, sorry, you can't whack the women. But anyway, he should... No, you're going to do this. The only way you should be yelled at in confession is if you refuse to repent. But why would you go to confession then, right? Everyone that goes to confession goes for the repentance. They need to know the mercy of God. And so you need to come and say, when you go to confession, now I, I had another priest friend that went there six months ago, he's from Indianapolis. And he says, Larry, I just went to Rome. I said, he's a pastor, I, I've heard his confession, great man. And he sat there and he says, you know, I decided to go to confession while I was over there. And I go, oh, yeah? I said, where'd you go? St. Mary Major, I go. Oh, yeah? And he says, and I went to this priest, and he yelled at me. And I go, oh, what did you get for a penance? <laughs> and he said, I have to say a rosary every day for 30 days. I said, I'm not even going to ask what you did. I don't even want to know. <laughs> but the reality is, when you go to confession, I remember when I got yelled at as a kid. And when I entered seminary, I went to Father McCullough, who's my spiritual director, God rest him, before Father Peterson. And he made me look at the crucifix. He said, Larry, look at the crucifix. And he said, Jesus did not go to the cross to kick you and tell you you're no good. He went to the cross to forgive you your sins. Every time you go to confession, ladies, you're going to Christ. You're going to the cross. And he's covering you with his blood. It'll cost him his life to forgive you. And he'll gladly do it when you ask him to, huh? And so you need to make sure that you make a good confession. Because a lot of people have never made a good confession because they're afraid. And that, you know, so if let's say you confessed and you purposely withheld a mortal sin, are any of your sins forgiven? No. It's like if you get cancer, what's the first thing you ask after a cancer surgery? Did they get it all? Because if one thing's left in there, you're going to die. Same with mortal sin. You need to confess everything. Now, if you forget it, that's a totally different thing. But if you sit there and say, I know, Father, I can't tell Father that, he'll think I'm nuts. Father already knows you're nuts. Come on. You can tell him. It's fine. You got to sit there. But see, most of us go with these, we walk around with these masks on our face and we think, if anyone really saw me how I am, they wouldn't be able to love me. When you go to confession, you take the mask down. And the priest who represents God and is in his, in his place looks at you and says, you are loved by the Father and you are forgiven in the name of Jesus. And that's the most freeing thing in the world when you meet Christ in the confessional and he forgives you your sins and loves you. That's the point. Every time you go to confession, you're meeting Christ who loves you. But you need to make a good confession. So we're going to go through a fast examination of conscience here. huh? Now, we're just going to go through the commandments. So the first commandment is what? I am the Lord. No false gods before me, right? So I ask all the people all the time, like, I've been here in confessions 25 years. That means is God first in your life? And what's the answer? No, he's not even close to first in anybody here's life. I'm sorry, not even the bishop. It doesn't work that way. We're all imperfect people. He needs to go to confession. A lot. But we all need to go to confession, huh? Every, no, I'm sorry, bishop. Please excuse me. The reality is that all of us have sinned. All of us. And we don't put God first. We want to, but we don't. And so one of the first things, like if I was to ask you what's the greatest sin, what would you say? Murder, rape, pride, abortion. Yeah, all those things you don't do. That's the greatest sins. Don't you think the greatest sin would be going against the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. I've never done it. I met John Paul II, Mother Teresa. They never did it. They wanted to, they desire, but none of us do. That means very simply, do you have a daily prayer life? Not try. When I do it, the men, I sit there and say, do you have a daily prayer life? The number one thing is, I try, Father. I go, try? Whack! You try. Do you try to eat every day? Only with men, ladies, don't worry. Only, uh, you try to eat every day? Well, no, Father. You try to watch TV every day? Well, no, Father. And why would you try to eat? Why would you try to pray? What's more important, praying or eating? Pray. Praying. So ladies... If you have daily, you need to have a daily committed prayer time. If you do not, Christ isn't even on the radar for you loving him above all things created. You fit everything else. I fit my prayer time in. I, I was too busy. I didn't have a chance to pray. 
Your whole day was wasted. You begin in prayer. Prayer is the most important thing. So we need to confess, okay, I don't love God above all things, okay? Second, now, you do know when I'm done, you have broken every commandment. You know that, right? <laughs> but we're going we're to help you. Don't worry. Second commandment is what? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Not just not in anger. It's not the gee, da, 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 gee, gee. But it's like, oh, my G-O-D, did you see what that person did? Oh, my G-O-D, they hit it out of the park. Well, what did they say do to you in the Old Testament if you just said the word God once? Stoned you to death, right? Oh, it's so, sorry, slip. Sorry, we're killing you. Huh? Isn't it amazing? God only gave 10 commandments. And one whole commandment is don't you use my name for any reason. You use his name only in prayer. So if you've done it, you've sinned, you need to move on. Third commandment. Keep holy the... What kind of sin is it to miss mass on Sunday, ladies? Mortal sin. What happens you die in mortal sin? You go to hell, knock pass, go, knock deck, $200. How many mortal sins does it take to go to hell? Father, I don't believe that. Nobody asked you. <laughs> Sorry, this is the commandment. You know, God, nobody asked you. God says it. Okay, so the reality is, you know, uh, when God says something, it takes three things to commit a mortal sin, though, correct? What are the three things it takes? Serious matter, full knowledge, full consent of will. You're all Father Dedish's parishioners, aren't you? I can tell. <laughs> Serious matter, he doesn't know it either. Full knowledge, full consent of the will. <laughs> so the reality is this. If you know it's wrong, it's wrong, you know it's wrong, you do it anyway, mortal sin, you must go to confession before you receive communion again. If you go to confession in a mortal sin, what do we call that? It's a sacrilege. Right? And so you cannot go to confession without going to, con you cannot go to communion without going to confession. Okay? Third commandment. Fourth commandment. Honor your father and mother. So do you honor your parents? If they're already dead, do you pray for them every day? They could be stuck in purgatory. Huh? Fifth commandment. You shall not kill. Okay. Now, Father, people often say, Father, you can't get me on that one. Oh, yeah? Our first speaker had an anger problem. I got a big anger problem. You can ask all my parishioners. It go around, anger is never the problem. Anger is always the symptom of either fear or hurt. And that's the way we protect ourselves. But so we can hurt our husbands and our kids by nasty things saying to them. We kill them. We kill them by saying bad things and hurtful things. And so have you done that? Have you had an abortion or helped someone else have an abortion? Now you do realize that that child is still alive. They see the face of God. So if you had an abortion, I've heard thousands and thousands throughout these years since I do these type talks. Your child has been praying for you to this moment to bring you home. They just want you to say you're sorry and tell them you're sorry for hurting them. So what you need to do is you need to confess that, of course, nobody here is going to yell at you. We're only going to love you. And then you need to feel the mercy of God. You need to ask God if he gave you a boy or girl or boys and girls. You have to name your son or daughter or sons and daughters. And then you have to reach into heaven and ask them by name for forgiveness. You say, Joe, I'm so sorry that I did that to you. And then you'll be set free. Okay? So we're giving you the out. The God of the universe, even when the world puts a period, God puts a comma and says, I take that life. I give that eternal life. You cannot stop my will. I will give that child eternal life. So you need to sit there and ask them, though, for mercy so you can feel forgiven and move on. The sixth commandment, I hate doing this for all you women, but anyway, we'll do it anyway. Sixth commandment. What's the sixth commandment? You shall not commit adultery. These are sins of the flesh. You know those things? Sins of the flesh are sexual sins, right? Now, when it comes to sexual sins, where's all sexual sin begin, you know? Between the ears. I was doing this once, and Father Solomon was there from the cathedral, and he was there. And it was all young adults there. And I said, all sexual sin begins between the... And he cried out, sheets. <laughs> and I says, thank you, Father, but you can do it above the sheets, too. Either way. But everyone here has sexual thoughts and fantasies. I have sexual thoughts and fantasies every day. They didn't magically go away when I got to be a priest. And some people say, well, women don't have those things. Shut up. I've been hearing confessions a long time. <laughs> Are sexual thoughts and fantasies wrong? No. It's only when you say yes to them, huh? It's like I used to tell my boys, you can let a bird fly over your head. You just don't want that bird to nest in your hair, right? So when you have a sexual thought or temptation, go, ooh, look at that. 
Now, come here, I want to spend some time with you, right? So you're at the beach and you see, <laughs> he's just a guy, sorry. You're at the beach and you see this gorgeous hunk of guy there walking around with his nice tan and his uh, G string or whatever he has on, his thong. And he walks by and he walks by. <laughs> That's just weird. And he winks at you. And as he winks at you, you go, praise God for his beauty. <laughs> Is there anything wrong with that? No, you're saying, God, you do great work. Keep it up, God. But the same person, <laughs> Dennis is dying. You, he's saying, that's me, that's me. Anyway, so, <laughs> you walk by. <laughs> Sorry, this is what ladies, what are you gonna, sorry. But the same reality happens and this guy walks by you and you think of every position sexually you could have them in the next hour. What, is that a sin? Yes, you've now used them as with yourself, you know, for as an object of pleasure. Some people, here we go, some people carry that through with themselves with masturbation, huh? Now, when was the last time you heard a good homily on masturbation? <laughs> Father Dedish? <laughs> anyway, so, the pro, and it's not just a guy thing, it's a woman thing. <laughs> they asked me to give the confession talk. This is the confession talk. The problem with it is sexuality should take you outside of yourself not turn you towards self. So the best way to confess that sin is just say, Father, I was impure with myself. Father will understand what you mean. He's not going to say, well, how do you do that exactly? Father! <laughs> so just, and, and again, true story, there's a priest in Diocese of Scranton, didn't like that word. He says, I don't like the word masturbation. So if you did that, just when you go to confession, say, Father, I loved my country. Okay? <laughs> So people would come and go to confession and say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been to six months since my last confession. I love my country four times since my last confession. Anyway, this goes on for years. <laughs> the pastor dies. A new pastor comes along. People are going and going to confession. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been six months since my last confession. I love my country a few times since my last confession. Da, da, da. Well, he doesn't know what's going on. So after about six months, he gets up and he had a Sunday mass and he goes, you know, we have a very patriotic parish here. <laughs> anyway, however you want to confess that it's up to you. Now, again, now that I'm all red, I'm not talking, I'm usually talking to men about this stuff. Anyway, so outside of marriage, everything's wrong outside of marriage. You know, people, my boys would say, Father, how far can I go before it's a sin? You know, sex outside of marriage, how far can you go? You want to know? Nothing below the neck. Either neck. Once I was talking to this, and one of the boys at prep raised his hand immediately. What? Can I turn her upside down, Father? <laughs> no, you can't turn her upside down. <laughs> you see what I got to deal with, right? Now, ladies, you got to be clear here because sometimes you just make that for kids. I don't care if you're 70, you can't go below the neck. That's the way it is. Well, Father, I've already been married. It's okay. No, it's not, unless that's your husband. But again, so nothing below the neck, either neck, okay? So if you committed adultery, have you used artificial birth control? If you're not married, have you had your marriage? If you are married, if you had your marriage blessed by the church, all these things, we're going to help you. Again, I, I, I say these things funny, and I make you laugh on purpose. And people, some people get mad. But I do it so you don't have to be afraid. Because I can't tell you how many men and women I've had crying because of some of these things. Father, I am so embarrassed. I couldn't even say that word, Father. That's why I say it to you, and I make it kind of funny. I'm not taking in any way, shape, or form the seriousness of sin away. I'm just saying, I want to make you to, not to be afraid to confess these things. You understand? So I want, for your sake, I'm not doing it, oh, what else am I going to do? And it's, so, so you have to do all those things. Have you had an abortion, help someone else, else have an abortion, confess it, okay? Have you lied, cheated, stolen, gossiped, been jealous, got drunk, got high, been judgmental? Is there anything else? Now, I ask what we call the questions. If you go for the questions with me, it'll take you less than 60 seconds. I'll just sit there and say, uh, married or single, because there's two different sets of questions. Don't ask the other priests to do this. They don't do it. I'm the only one that does it, so don't even ask them. But if you go, and they'll help you out, though, if you ask. They'll help you, of course. But if you go to me, I'll just say, do you pray every day? Yes or no? Use God's name in vain. Yes or no? Missed mass. Dishonored your parents. Got angry. Hurt others with your words. Made fun of others. Had an abortion. Helped someone have an abortion. Impure thoughts. Impure actions to yourself. If you're not married, oral sex. Another intercourse. Another married. Artificial birth control. If you looked at pornography, have committed adultery. Have you had sex with someone of the same sex? Have you lied, cheated, stolen, gossiped, been jealous, got drunk, got high, been judgmental? 
been proud, you consistently take care of the poor. Is there anything else? Now, normally it's, yes, 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 yes. No, I'd never do that one, Father. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I think I'd like to try that one, Father. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Anything else? Yeah, I did something to a cat, and I don't want to tell you, so I'm sorry. So, you're forgiven. So the only thing I've ever given is one hour, Father, for a penance, right? If I, and some people say, Father, I don't think that's enough. I go, well, nobody asked you. Huh? So the only thing, you don't have to even know, we're going to say an act in contrition together, so you don't have to say it again when you're in confession. Just, ladies, just know that we have a 1,000 women here, and we have 28 priests. So we're not gonna, we can't do a lot of counseling in that, dear. The only thing we're going to do is really help and set you free. So don't be afraid to do that. Now, one other thing is, you know, often we think that the greatest sins are sins of commission. But according to Jesus, what are the greatest sins? Sins of omission, what we fail to do, how we fail to take care of the poor. And what we fail to do the most is with our families. You know, sometimes, like there was a story I was listening to here years ago, and there was a, a guy who was, at, uh, he was a Protestant pastor, and he was telling a story about a woman that came to, uh, came to church one day, and she was crying, and he goes, what's the matter, what's the matter? And she, he says, the woman says, well, Father, I was praying with my daughter last night. And he goes, well, that's good. No, no, no. What's the matter? He says, well, as I was praying for my daughter, my daughter says, God bless Mommy, God bless Daddy, God bless Grandma. And he goes, well, that's great. No, 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 no. What happened? She said, God bless Snoopy and different things. And then my daughter says, and God, please let Mommy be as nice at home as she is to the people at church. <laughs> hmm. Do we get real holy when we're in front of other people or we're in church? And we treat our families like garbage sometimes. When you and I die, the first place we'll be judged was on how we dealt with our families. So that means we got to affirm them. We got to tell them we love them. We got to love them. We got to put them first. And most mothers, ladies, you do this better than any man ever. You know how to do it. But sometimes, not everybody. So you often got to sit there and know. You got to tell the people you love that you love them. How often? Every day, huh? And again, I always use the same story, but, you know, growing up in Pittsburgh, both my parents, cops. A lot of cops, it's hard to become a cop, you know? It's something bad usually happens to you. I mean, you have something bad. So some guys, in my experience, to deal with it, not just the guys, but the women, drink a lot and become alcoholics. One man was a great alcoholic. He decided to leave his wife and kids, moved out to Las Vegas, because everybody's happy there, right? Got a new wife, new kids, wasn't happy there, went to Houston, because everybody's happy in Houston, Texas, right? But he kept drinking and drinking and drinking. And after there, this young man, he was only 43 years old, which is quite young, is it not? Baby! I'm 54, baby! I was a senior in college seminary, and I knew the man, and so his wife called me and says, Larry, he's dying, you think you can come here and be with him? I said, of course, that's what I do, I'm a seminarian, yes! And I flew out to Houston, Texas. When I was there, I was not prepared for what I saw. This man, who was only 43 years old, going to be 44 in a couple days, I walked in there, and he was in the IC room, and as he was laying there, he, had, he was on a respirator. He couldn't talk to me. He had stuff all over him. He looked like he was 95 years old, literally dying of AIDS. Horrendous. And I walked in there, and I go, you look like hell. <laughs> I have a negative humor. I don't know if you figured that out yet. But anyway, so, and I sat there, and I, I was praying with this man, helping this man as best I could. Anyway, I had to get back to seminary. It was my senior year of seminary. So I'm sitting there saying to him, this is in September, and I said, listen, I got to go. But you know, I'm going to be graduating from college in May. It'd be great if you could be there. And he shook his head up and down. But we both knew this wasn't going to happen. He was going to die. So I start walking. I go, I'll pray for you. Always priests and that can sound so holy. And we start walking out of the room. And as we walk, I walk, he's walking out of the room. I thought it'd be the last time I saw him. So I turned to get a last look. And he's desperately calling me back with his arms like this. And I ran around the other side of the bed. I go, what's the matter? What's the matter? What can I do for you? And this man grabbed me and he took me and he hugged me so close to himself. And as he's holding me so close to himself, I look up at him and I go, yeah, I love you too, Dad. And a little later, my dad died. The only time I ever told my dad that I loved him was on my death, his deathbed, right? Isn't it amazing? Jesus Christ gave all of us just one commandment. Love. Love one another as I have loved you. John chapter 13, verse 34 says, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Verse 35 says... All people will know you're my disciples because you love one another. So ladies, you can go to daily mass, say a rosary every day. If you don't love others, you'll still go to hell. Simple. It ain't just going through the motions. We need to be people of love. We need to tell the people we love that we love them. Now I did that, and I've been telling this story a long time, but my mother's a little German lady, right? 
And my mother, all these years, I'd sit there and say, I got to make sure I do the same thing with my mother because she didn't respond. I'd say, Mom, I love you. Nothing. Mom, I love you. God bless you. Years. Nothing. Once I'm driving to Davenport, Iowa to give a talk, and as I'm driving uh, to uh, Peoria, Illinois, I'm sorry, as I'm driving, I'm saying, okay, Mom, I love you. God bless you. And Mom says, yeah, I love you too, Larry. <gasps> I almost wrecked the car. It took her years for her to respond. Ladies, your kids just want to know that you love them. And for most of you, do this. But if not, you got to tell them that you love them. How often? Every day. I'd encourage you. I'd give this to the men. I'll give it to the women. I want you to write, if your kids, as you don't have any parents yet, I want you to write two letters tonight before you go to bed. One to your mother, one to your father. And I want you to tell them that you love them and why. Ladies, if you have 10 kids, it's going to be a long night. <laughs> I want you to write, handwrite to each of your children and tell them that you love them and why. This isn't your time to sit there and say, you know, you disappoint me. I wish you'd go to church. Shut up. That'll take them farther away. Just, I love you and I'm proud of you. And the way I want you to write this letter, as if by tonight midnight, you or they would be dead. What would you want to say in that letter? Ladies, the most important thing in life is that we love God and we love others. That's when we say yes. Mary said yes. And she brought life and love into the world. When we say no, that's why we go to confession. So that we can continue to say our yes. So that we continue to bring life. If you love people and you tell the people you love that you love them every day, you are bringing life to this world. Because the deepest need in everyone's heart is to be loved. That's what you want. That's what everyone in your family wants. So be the instrument of salvation to them. The instrument of life to them. Love them and tell them you love them. And just ask God for mercy to help you to love more. You got it? You get it? You're going to do it? That was 56 minutes. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you. He who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Ladies, go to confession. Do not be afraid. God bless you.